Good evening, we're here in the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room. The Orbit 3 team is on duty and we're a few hours from the crew wake. During this time, we're taking the opportunity to speak with some of the flight controllers here on the Orbit 3 team. Joining us this time is Kristen Woolard, who is the ECOM position here in the sh Shuttle Flight Control Room. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell us about the ECOM position? Yes, ECOM stands for Emergency Environmental and Consumables Management. So we have a number of different systems that we're responsible for on the shuttle. Um, any emergency um, like a fire or if atmosphere started leaking um, out of the cabin, we would handle. We're also responsible for all vehicle cooling. Um, we have a number of systems that uh, you know reject heat from the vehicle. We're also responsible for the environment, um, not only temperature, but the right balance of oxygen and nitrogen in the cabin, removing CO2, stuff like that. Tell us, um, since you cover the emergency aspects of the flight. Uh, how do you prepare for that? What do you do pre-flight leading up to it? How do you work with the crew on that? And is there anything during the mission that you do to support that? Well, we have lots of training. Our overall training flow is extensive and covers some of our nominal stuff as well as all of those emergencies. Um, for, e for each flight, we actually have specific sims that are emergency sims. And those are usually really exciting for us since we handle the emergencies. So we usually have one of those before each flight that is that you know is going to be an emergency case. The crew is involved. Um, the crew also has a lot of standalone emergency training, and we participate in some of that. And then just the normal training flow, the sims leading up to a flight, you know, emergency, emergencies are included in some of those cases. OK, and then during the mission, what kinds of key milestones does your team have? Well, during the mission, we have a lot of nominal procedures that we work throughout a flight. Um, we're always following along closely when we're docking to the International Space Station and combining our atmospheres. And we have some nominal procedures. Periodically, we have to dump water overboard um, and, you know, things like that. We have pressure maintenances that we perform. And so those are the nominal activities we, we perform through every flight. Um, when stuff is broken, uh, we usually have some additional procedures to work. Fortunately, so far, that hasn't happened on this flight, so it's been a pretty quiet flight. You brought up a really interesting aspect to the mission. You said when they dock and they have to mix, mix the atmospheres. What kind of special things do you do for that situation? Well, before we dock, um, we're looking at where the pressure and oxygen are on the International Space Station and where we predict the shuttle is going to be so we can predict where we equalize. Um, sometimes the space station has certain agreements and they want us to come in at a particular pressure or a particular balance between oxygen and nitrogen. So we work with them pre-flight and leading up to docking to make sure that our atmosphere is um, at a good level for when we combine. So for tomorrow's undocking, is there special things in that regard as well? Yes, for undocking, we'll be following along with the hatch closure. And then when the, uh, when the shuttle and the ISS are docked, there's a small volume in between called the vestibule. So when we're going to undock, what we do is the ISS closes a hatch, and then the shuttle closes a hatch, and then we depressurize that vestibule back down to vacuum before we undock. After we depressurize that vest vestibule, we also do a leak check to make sure that the shuttle and station aren't leaking before we end up. And is it your team that's responsible for that depress? Yes, we are we are monitoring the depress. The crew's the one actually, you know, performing the actions and we'll monitor the depress and uh, the pressure for the leak check. Okay, so you've told us a lot about what you normally do. What is your favorite aspect of the mission? I think um, this is I think probably once it lands, um, not because I'm glad it's over, but it's nice to know that a mission has been completed successfully, the crew's home safely, you know, you can look back and really see um, that it all came together and went well. And that's really satisfying to know that all that was completed and you had a part in that. What's the hardest part about your job and the support role you have in the mission? Well, technically, of course, it's challenging and the hours can be long. Um, I think on a day-to-day, -day, you know, on console, one of the things that can be uh, most difficult is being able to monitor all the different conversations going on at one time, be able to uh, weed out what you don't need to hear, but tune into what you do need to hear. Uh, that takes a lot of practice. You bring up a really good point. I am imagine that you're supported by some background folks. Do they help with listening and monitoring those conversations? Absolutely. We have two backroom positions in the ECOM group, the life support and the thermal, and they kind of split the split the ECOM systems and are responsible for those. But they're listening to all the loops as well, and uh, they do a really good job of, you know, helping us out, like, if, if there's something we need to be listening to, making sure we hear it as well and, you know, keeping everybody on the same page. 
Right. We hope to be able to do some interviews with them as well. Um, let's now switch over to your personal story. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what drew you to this career. Okay, I was uh, born in Texas, but I moved around a lot as a kid, and I grew up uh, outside of Los Angeles. Uh, then I came to Texas A&M for college, and so I've been back in Texas ever since, which is nice. Uh, at A&M, I studied biomedical engineering, and I got both my bachelor's and master's there. And did you always want to work for NASA? How did you end up working in the space program? Honestly, it never occurred to me. Um, it just wasn't something I'd ever thought of. I, uh, I was nearing the end of my master's and went to a career fair. And I talked to a couple different companies and saw that NASA had a booth. And I thought, well, wonder what, what they are here specifically for. And they were here, they are hiring flight controllers and trainers. And so I talked to them and they explained to me what flight control was. I mean, I'd seen Apollo 13 and but I didn't you know, know the details of what was involved. So they explained all that to me. And the thing that appealed to me most, I think, was that um, it sounded like a job that would never get boring. There was always going to be something new to learn. It was always going to be exciting. And so that was what really grabbed me. So for other people who maybe are watching and haven't thought about a career at NASA, do you have any advice for them? Or It's great. If you haven't thought about it, you should do it. Um, I think uh, for me, when I started college, I was, you know, interested in engineering, but wasn't really sure if that was a good fit. Um, I got some really great advice from an advisor, and she, she said, you know, if you think engineering might be something you want to do, you ought to start, start with it, because it's a whole lot easier to get out of engineering than it is to get into engineering. So I thought that was made a lot of sense. Um, and, and I really liked engineering, and so I stuck with it, and it led me here. And so I think that was, you know, a great piece of advice that, um, you know. What were, what were some of the kinds of things, you know, as a younger student, maybe in high school, that led you down to, to being attracted to engineering? Were there certain types of classes or aspects that you were? Well, for me, into? I was always interested. I was actually biomedical engineering, um, which is not as common, it seems like, here. Um, and, and so for me, it was always, I considered medical school. I was, I was interested in, you know, medical type. And, and so that was why biomedical engineering um, appealed to me. Um, I, I like adding the engineering with the biomedical and not just science. Um, you know, I enjoy the math and the physics and stuff like that. So that was um, why I was considering biomedical engineering and, and really found it fascinating all throughout college. Are there aspects to that biomedical degree that apply to your job now? I wouldn't say so much the biomedical, it's more the engineering background. Um, people in, in my group have all kinds of engineering degrees, that's the main thing we have in common. And so I don't use as much of the biomedical part of my degree, but more the engineering basics. That's one thing we've really seen through all of these interviews is the diverse range of backgrounds as well as degrees that all play into the team here. So thanks for sharing your unique story. Thank you. And again, Christian Wallard, the ECOM here in the Orbit 3 flight control team.